some back and some not back. So uh, let's keep everybody in prayer and look around, see who's not here and see what we can do for them. Let's begin with word of prayer. Dear the Father, we are so very thankful that we can have this time to assemble together as your children. We pray, Father, that we've all realized the importance of what we're doing and why we're doing it, that we're not only worshiping you, but that we can edify one another, that we can uh, gain greater knowledge and increase our faith, that we can perhaps be strong enough to be able to uh, withstand the wiles of the devil and that we can take our knowledge and tell others about the story of Jesus Christ. We're so very thankful, Father, for what Jesus has done for each one of us by dying on the cross for our sins. And it is through his name that we pray. Amen. Please turn to number 361, number 361, this world is not my home. <clears throat> this world is not my home, I'm just a passing room. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. The angels back and me from heaven's open. I can't feel in this world anymore. Oh, Lord, you know I have a friend like you. If hell is not my home, then Lord, what will I do? The angels beckon me from heaven's open door. And I can't feel at home in this world Expecting me, and that's one thing I know. My Savior guarded me, and now I onward go. I know you'll take me through, though I am weak and poor, and I can't be at home in this world anymore. Oh Lord, you know I have no friend like you. If heaven's not my home, then Lord, what will I do? The angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I can't be at home in this world anymore. I am the loving Savior of the glory man. I don't expect to stop until I with him stand. He's waiting now for me in heaven's open door. And I can't be at home in this world anymore. Oh, Lord, you know I have no friend like you. If heaven's not my home, then Lord, what will I do? The angels back at me from heaven's open door. I can't be at home in this world anymore. Yes, nothing glory and will live eternally. The saints on every hand are shouting to glory. Their song of sweetest praise drift back from heaven's shore. And I can't be at home in this world
Good afternoon. I'd like to read from the book of Revelations, chapter 20, verses uh, 10 through 15. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are, and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. And I saw a great white throne and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life and death, were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged every man according to their works. And the death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in that book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Now, if you all stand available for a word of prayer. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we come before you at this time with bowed heads and humbled hearts, thanking you for the many blessings that you give us in this life. Father, we're thankful for the family we have here in Terre Haute. 
that make up this congregation. Father, we're thankful for the strength, the knowledge that we have. Father, we pray that this place can always be a shining light in this community. Help us always to endeavor to teach the truth and to be that example for others. Father, we pray that you would continue to be with John and his family as they labor here with us. Help us to see the word for it is written and apply it to our lives and live that life the way we may see our names in that book of life. Father, we are thankful for the many other blessings that you give us in this life and comfort. Father, we pray for those that are not with us today, those that have been mentioned of a physical illness, Father, or treatments. Father, we pray that you would be with them, those that are recovering from surgeries, as well as those that are facing surgeries. Father, you know it's our heart's desire that they will return to their health and can be with us and continue with us and serve for many years. Father, most of all, we pray for those who spiritually have left the fold or not right with thee at this time. Father, we pray that they would see the error of their ways and make those corrections that need be done and repent of those things and be joined back to the fold. Father, we pray that you would also continue to help us to look to heaven every day of our lives. As it seems the world gets more and more wicked and Satan has more and more influences. Father, we pray that we can always look to each other as well as thee for the strength that we need to do what is right and follow thy word. We thank you, Father, for the many answered prayers that you have given us. We thank you for life. We thank you for our family here once again. Father, we pray that you would be with us this hour. Be with John as he proclaims the gospel to us once again from thy word. That we can understand it and apply it to our hearts. And apply it to our lives to be that continuing example as long as we walk this earth. We thank you, Father, for your son, Jesus, who was willing to die on the cross, give his life and give his blood to give us that hope of salvation through the New Testament. Father, we pray that we never forget that and we can always remember that, not only on the first day of the week, but every day of our lives, what Christ did for us. We ask for all these blessed favors in Jesus' name. Amen. Number 68. Number 68. Count your blessings. <clears throat> When you look at others with their hands and gold, 
Thank you, Keith, for leading us in that song. It's a good reminder of the need to count our blessings. Appreciate the fact that you're here. We have some visiting with us, and we're always glad to have you. On a personal note, let me just take a moment and express appreciation for your care on behalf of Alicia and each one of us for her recent surgery. It means a great deal. It's a reminder that we just don't know what a day will bring forth and how much we need one another. And you've gone out of your way to express your concern for her, and we appreciate that so very much. Due to visitor restrictions, couldn't have anybody in the waiting room or at the hospital. And yet I got a number of texts as I was waiting on her to come out of surgery, and it meant a lot. I just want you to know that Though we were in different places doing different things, it meant a lot to know that you took time out of your day to pray with us and for us. And we appreciate that. Those who've done other things beyond that from a physical standpoint, we just want you to know we appreciate it very much. We love you and thank you. I want to talk to us this afternoon about the topic, the ark and the church. It's a comparison. I believe that the ark well represents in the Old Testament, the church of the New Testament, lots of ways. And I want to show you what I have in mind. In the book of Genesis chapter 6, you recall that conditions so deteriorated in humanity that God brought about the end. He said in Genesis 6.13, Unto Noah, the end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them, and behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Make thee an ark of gopher wood, room shalt thou make in the ark, and shalt pitch it within, without with pitch. And this is the fashion which thou shalt make it of. The length of the ark shall be 300 cubits, the breadth of it 50 cubits, and the height of it 30 cubits. A window shalt thou make to the ark, and in the cubit shalt thou finish it above. And the door of the ark shalt thou set to the side thereof, with lower, Second and third story shalt thou make it. And behold, I, even I, do bring a flood of waters upon the earth to destroy all flesh, wherein is the breath of life from under heaven, and everything that is in the earth shall die. But with thee will I establish my covenant, and thou shalt come into the ark, thou and thy sons, and thy wife, and thy sons' wives with thee, and of every living thing of all flesh, two of every sort shalt thou bring into the ark to keep them alive with thee. They shall be male and female, of fowls after their kind, and of cattle after their kind, of every creeping thing of the earth after his kind, two of every sort shall come into thee to keep them alive. And take thou unto thee of all food that is eaten, and thou shalt gather it to thee, and it shall be for food for thee and for them. Thus did Noah, according to all that God commanded him, so did he. And so God made provision for salvation in the ark. The New Testament church is God's provision for us today. It's our ark of safety and hope. In the book of Matthew chapter 
16, when Jesus asked the disciples, Whom say ye that I am? Peter answered, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon bar Jonah, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Now what do these two things have in common? The ark and the church. We'll put it side by side and notice how they're similar. First of all, when you think about the ark, the builder was Noah, God's servant. When God said to Noah, Genesis 6, 13, the end of all flesh has come before me. And then he said in verse 14, make thee an ark of gopher wood. And so Noah was the ark builder. In Hebrews chapter 11, verse 7, in the faith hall of fame, right, Nicholas? The Bible says, by faith Noah, being warned of God with things not seen as yet, move with fear, prepared an ark. And so in this text, he's the ark preparer. Or the ark builder. And so the ark was built by Noah, God's servant. Whereas the church of the New Testament was built by Christ, God's son. In Matthew 16 and 18, Jesus, the son of God, said, I will build my church. Peter had just confessed that Jesus is the Christ, the son of the living God. But as you look at the two side by side, notice that with reference to the ark, it was built of one material. The material of which the ark was made was gopher wood. God said to Noah, make thee an ark of gopher wood. Genesis 6 and verse 14. But the New Testament church is made of materials consisting of living stones. Notice as the ark was made of one material, gopher wood, the New Testament church is made of the material of lively stones or living stones as 1 Peter 2, 5 says. He also as lively stones are built up a spiritual house and holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. And then next, think about the fact that with the ark, there was one source of light. You read of one window in the ark pattern. When God gave instruction to Noah, make the ark, he said in verse 16, a window, not windows plural, but one source of light shalt thou make to the ark. And in a cubit shalt thou finish it above. Does the church have a source of light? Is there a window? If you will, there is but one light. And that light is, of course, the Bible, the Word of God. It's our one source of light. In the book of Psalms, the psalmist said in Psalm 119, verse 105, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. It is the perfect light. It's the perfect law of liberty. James 1, 25. It's the all-sufficient light. No other light is needed. And that it thoroughly furnishes us unto all good works. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. And as Peter said in 2 Peter 1 and in verse 3, according as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness. And so no other light is needed. But then when you look at the ark, it had but one entrance. Notice the Bible talks about the door. There wasn't provision made for many different means of entrance into the ark. As Genesis 6, 16 says, the door of the ark. And in chapter 7 and verse 16, God shut the door. The Lord shut him in. And as the ark had but one means of entrance, one door, so it is with the church. There is but one entrance into the church, and that is through the door. That's Christ. He's identified as the door. In the 10th chapter of John, when the church is set forth in the figure of a sheepfold, Jesus said, I am the door. He's not a door among many different doors. You know, sometimes with a house, you've got lots of doors, exterior doors. You've got a front door, maybe a side door, a back door. All different ways of getting in and out of that, but with reference to the church, there's the one way in to the church of our Lord, and that's through Christ, the door. In John chapter 14 and verse 6, Jesus said, when Thomas asked, how shall we know the way? He said, I am the way. Not a way. You, know, you look to the various world religions and you think that there are lots of different ways to heaven. Maybe a way through Buddha, and a way through uh, Muhammad, and a way through Christ. But this is the exclusive way. Jesus is not a way, but the way. 
He said, no man cometh unto the Father but by me. And so if we miss Christ, we miss our means of entrance. If we reject Christ, we have the door shut when it comes to entering the Lord's church. But also there was but one family we read about in connection with the ark. That's the family of Noah that consisted of eight souls. Genesis chapter 7, verse 7, Noah went in, his sons and his wife and his sons' wives with him into the ark because of the waters of the flood. And then down at verse 23, how that Noah remained alive and they that were with him in the ark. Peter talking about that in 1 Peter 3, 20 and 21, talked about Noah and how that the days of Noah, the ark was of preparing, were in few, that is, eight souls were saved by water. One family, Noah's family. And yet with reference to the church, there is but one family. God has but one family, the church of Christ. In Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 15, notice the language Paul used when he said, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. In John chapter 17, when the Lord prayed for unity, as we talked about in our Bible class this morning, unity through the truth, through the word. The Lord said, neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word. And so there is but one family, the church, that belongs to Jesus Christ, identified as the church of Christ in Romans chapter 16 and in verse 16. Notice also there is but one name with reference to the ark in Genesis chapter 6. We read of the name of Noah when God, the Lord said unto Noah, Genesis 7 verse 1, Thus did Noah, Genesis 6, 22, and so on. These are the generations of Noah. You read of Noah, one name. And thus it is with the church. There is but one name, and that is the name Christian. That identifies those of us who make up the body of Christ. In Acts chapter 11 and then verse 26, we read of the fact that the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. Those weren't hyphenated Christians. They weren't different kinds of Christians, just called Christians. That's all the Bible will make us. You know, Acts 26, 28, when Paul was with King Agrippa, and he said, almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. That's all he was trying to get him to be. And that's all we read about, the Lord's people being called Christians. In 1 Peter 4, 16, Peter said, if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. And so one name, we're called Christians. And then notice again, when you look at the ark, side by side, there was but one building, one vessel. The Lord didn't say make arks, plural, as if there was more than one, or uh, he didn't make provision for some lifeboats that were, folks could be saved outside of the ark. You know, a lot of the big sailing vessels will have some lifeboats. You think about the Titanic. You had people that were saved outside of the Titanic. They were saved in the lifeboat outside of the Titanic. That's not the way it worked with the ark. No provision made for anybody saved outside of the ark. But those that were saved were saved in one building. Make the an ark, it's singular, one building. And thus it is with the church. There is but one building, the church. And there's no lifeboats, if you will, outside of the church. It's not that you've got multiple buildings or multiple churches in which a person may be saved. In Ephesians chapter 3, verse 8, Paul said unto me, who am less and the least of all saints is this grace given, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ, and to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God, who created all things by Jesus Christ to the intent that now under the principalities and powers and heavenly places might be known by the church, might circle the church, singular, one building, the manifold wisdom of God according to the eternal purpose which he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord. Then back up in chapter 2 when he talks about the church as the household of God, verse 19, the household, one. And then... He said, built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom all the building, singular, circled the building. The church is the building, fitly framed together, groweth unto an holy temple in the Lord. One building with reference to the ark and one 
in reference to the church. But then back to the ark in the book of Genesis. Notice that salvation was in the ark. All that were saved were in the ark. In Genesis 6 and in verse 23, Noah only remained alive and they that were with him. Where? In the ark. Circle the word in, underscore the ark. If you wanted to be saved in the day of Noah, where did you need to be? You had to be in the one building with the one family, Noah, and enter it through the one entrance by the door that had the one source of light. And when you think about the church today, the saved today are in the church. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 23, Acts 2, 47 shows that to be the case. In Acts 2, when the church was first established and folks heard the preaching of the gospel, the repentance and remission of sins preached in Jerusalem among all nations in the name of Christ, beginning at Jerusalem. And the Lord added to the church. Who did he add to the church? The saved, he said, Acts 2, 47. Luke said, the Lord added to the church daily such as were saved or such as were saved. And then in Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 23, when Paul wrote about it, he talked about Christ and said that he is the Savior, the Savior of the body. So where are the saved? The saved are in the body, in the church. No saved outside of the church. Back in Ephesians 2, he said in verse 13, Now in Christ Jesus, he who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. Then in verse 16, he said that he might reconcile both unto God, where? In one body. Whatever the body is, it's the place where folks are reconciled to God. Where we're near unto God, we're nigh unto God. He identifies the body back in chapter 1, 22 and 23, when he said the church which is his body. And so the saved are where? In the one body, in the church, the one building that we were talking about. As the saved were in the ark, in the days of Noah, the saved today are in the church. And then looking at that from the other standpoint, from Genesis 6, that destruction was to all who are on the outside of the ark. He showed the importance of the ark. Showed the, the necessity of being in the ark. And underscores the fact that if you weren't in the ark, then you would have perished, look at or been destroyed. Genesis 7 makes that clear. Verse 23, every living substance was destroyed, which was upon the face of the ground, both man and cattle and the creeping thing and the fowl of the heaven, and they were destroyed from there. That shows God's attitude about that. It shows how, indeed, it, was, it repented the Lord that he had made man, and it grieved him at his heart. How grieved was he? So grieved that he said, I'll destroy man whom I've created from the face of the earth. Genesis 6 and verse 7. Think about something you've created, and... And God creating man and him being so grieved at his heart that he decided to destroy his creation from the face of the earth. And everything outside the ark was destroyed. Every living substance upon the face of the ground. They were destroyed. But how does that compare with the church when you come to the New Testament? As there was destruction to all outside of the ark, destruction will come to all who are outside the church. And as that showed the importance of the ark and the need to be in the ark, this truth also highlights the importance of the church, the need to be in the church. Some people think, well, the church isn't that important. Would you have said in the days of, no, that ark isn't that important. I don't need to be in the ark. I mean, I'd just be satisfied to live outside of the ark. And I'm going to go along with everybody else out here. In fact, there's just a few people in the ark, and I'm going to stay out here. And some people get to thinking that they can live without the church, that the church isn't important, they don't need the church. But as there is destruction to all outside the ark, destruction will be to those who are outside of Christ, outside the church. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, Paul said in verse 7, To you who are troubled, rest with us. When the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels, in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God, and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished, Punished how? Punished with what? With everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. Destruction came to those outside the ark and destruction will come to those who are outside of Christ and the church. And then one other point that I want to 
think with you in regard to the ark and the church. With reference to the ark, there was one hope that was realized. One life. And that was in the new world. It wasn't in the old world. It wasn't in the world that was overflow with water. That's not where the hope was. It wasn't in that world. But it was in the, the new world. And that life was realized as Second Peter talks about when in Second Peter 2, Peter said in verse 5, Spared not the old world, but saved Noah, the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly. So there was an old world and a new world. The old world was not the world of hope. And thus it is with the church. There is but one hope to attain. There, there's one, one promise and one expectation. And it's not in this world. It's not in this life. It's in the world to come. It's eternal life. That's why we sang, I believe it was, at the start of the service, this world is not my home, right? Because our hope is not in this world. And sometimes maybe we get to thinking about that. We, we think that our hope is here. It's not here. We build our hopes on things eternal. The Bible talks about hope of eternal life. When Paul wrote Titus, for example, in the book of Titus chapter 1 and in verse 2, he said, in hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. And somebody said, I'd like to have that hope, hope of eternal life. It's available. Where is that hope? John tells us where it is in 1 John chapter 5 and verse 11. He said, and this is the record, that God hath given to us eternal life, and this life is in His Son. It's in Christ. It's in the church. There is no hope elsewhere because there's only one hope. Ephesians 4.4, 4, Paul talked about one body and one spirit as you're called in one hope of your calling. So if this hope is in Christ and it's hope of eternal life, then there is no hope outside of Christ, outside of the church. And I want you to appreciate it's not in this world. It's in the world to come. In the book of Romans chapter 8, verse 24, Paul highlighted the importance of hope. He said we're saved by hope. But hope that is seen is not hope. We don't have it. We don't have eternal life. We don't have what we're looking for, what we're expecting. Just like a person hopes maybe for good health. They, not, they don't have their good health right now. They hope, they hope maybe they're on the road to, to recovery. They're undergoing treatments. They have hope, hope of better days to come. And so you hope for that. You don't have it right now. And maybe a little boy is hoping for a, a sandbox, right? He wants a sandbox. He wants to make some sandcastles or whatever. He don't have, a, he don't have the sandbox right now. He wants one. He like, he, he's hoping maybe he'll get one for his birthday. We hope for what we don't have. That's the point. And people think we have eternal life right now. We don't have eternal life. In reality, we have it in hope. We hope for eternal life. Paul said in the teaching concerning the resurrection, 1 Corinthians 15, he said, if in this life only we have hope in Christ, we're of all men most miserable. If this is all there is, then we're most miserable. This isn't all there is. There's hope in the world to come. He, that hope is an anchor. Anchor is important. Ever been on a lake when the winds pick up and you want to stay in one spot? You need a good anchor, don't you? Hebrews 6 18 says that by two immutable things in which it was impossible for God to lie, we might have a strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope set before us, which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which entereth into that within the veil. So there's a comparison, a likeness between the ark and the church. Had one builder, Noah, God's servant, the church built by Christ, the Son of God, one material, go for wood, one material of the church, living stones, and one light. The Bible is our light. It's our guiding light. One way in, the, the ark door, and Christ being the door of the church. One family, one name, one building. Saved in the ark, destruction all outside, and one hope realized. Peter recognized that there was a likeness between 
Noah's salvation and our salvation today, when he wrote what he did in 1 Peter 3, he said in verses 20 and 21, which sometime were disobedient when once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah while the ark was a preparing, wherein few, that is, eight souls were saved by water. So Noah and his family were saved in the ark by water. How did that work? How were they saved by water? Somebody said, I thought they were saved from water. Well, that's not what Peter said. Peter said they were saved by water. And Genesis 7, 17 shows us how that worked. The flood was 40 days upon the earth, and the waters increased and bear up the ark. That's how they were saved by water. In that the flood waters bear up the ark, kept it afloat. And thus they were saved in the ark by water. And then he says in verse 21, the like figure, we're into even baptism, doth also now save us. Now he didn't say we're saved by water. We're not saved by water. But he said we're saved by baptism. So I said, oh, baptism is an immersion in water. That's true. But it's not the water that saves us. In fact, baptism doesn't mean water. The word baptism means immersion. There's not a drop of water in the word baptism. You know, the Israelites were baptized under Moses in the cloud and in the sea, and they didn't get wet. And yet that was called a baptism. There's a baptism of fire, no water involved in that. Baptism of the Holy Spirit. Baptism doesn't mean water. And so he switches gears. So he says, they were saved by water, but we're saved by baptism. And... So as they were saved by water in the ark, we're saved by baptism into the church. And 1 Corinthians 12, 13 says, For by one spirit are you all baptized into one body. And so we must appreciate being saved like Noah. Noah was saved by faith. He was saved by grace. He was saved by obedience. And thus it is with us today. We must put our Faith and trust in the Lord, hearing his word, believing with all of our heart, repenting of our sins, confessing our faith in Christ as the Son of God, being baptized. That's how we get into the church, our ark of safety, our refuge of hope. We have hope of eternal life in the world to come and then to be faithful, faithful unto death, Revelation 2.10. Noah did according to all that God commanded him, Genesis 6.22. And Christ teaches us to observe all things whatsoever commanded, Matthew 28, 19 and 20. And we need to be faithful in doing what the Lord commands of us so that we can realize the one hope in the world to come. If not a faithful Christian, we need to repent of that, ask for God's forgiveness, and then be faithful in confessing our sins as we strive to walk in the light. And if we can assist you in making your life right with God, we assure you that all things are ready. Never be any more convenient for you than it is right now. No need to leave if you're not ready. Let us help you in every way that we can from a spiritual standpoint. While we stand and sing the song, we cordially invite you to come.
that needs to partake of the Lord's Supper? Yeah. This still being the first day of the week, we give those who were not here this morning an opportunity to remember our Lord and Savior. We need to also be partakers of this and reflection of this time of our death of our Savior on the cross, the life that he gave for us. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for this opportunity to surround this table once more. Father, we pray that at this time you'd be with the one partaking of the bread and remembrance of Christ's body that felt the pain and the anguish and was nailed to that cross there at Calvary. Father, we pray at this time you bless this bread and remembrance of that body. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Let us pray. Father, we continue to surround this table in remembrance of our Lord and Savior at this time. Father, we now ask that you bless this cup, containing the fruit of the vine, which is remembrance of that blood that Christ gave on that cross for us, that sinless blood that can wash away sins. Father, we bless you bless it, bless the one partaking. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.
Number 27, be with me, Lord. Dear Lord, we come to you at the close of our service, thanking you for the day you've given us to worship you and learn about you and become better Christians. We ask that you be with those that were mentioned that are sick physically and those that are preparing for surgeries and those that are recovering from surgeries. Be with those that are sick spiritually as well. Something may be said or done to bring them back to the church. We ask that you be with our elderly, keep a watch over them, and keep them safe and keep them healthy. We thank you for allowing us all to be here, keeping us healthy and blessing us with health. We ask that you be with those that need your care at this time that maybe don't know it, but you see all and you can help them more than any of us could. We thank you for the blessing of Christ and the sacrifice that he made to come down on this cross, to come down to this earth and down the cross for our sins. Be with us until we gather at the next appointed time. And it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.